Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. And I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, our host, the DeKalb County Public Library and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing series of online author events. We, of course, would like to thank the DeKalb Library Foundation. They pay for the Zoom account that we present all of these wonderful programs to you on and allow us to come into your homes to where you can enjoy these events with good social distancing. Um, and it may stay that way for a little bit while longer. So thank you so very much for indulging us and, and joining us here online. I'd like to remind you of a few things after our formal presentation. If you would like to ask William a question, please feel free to type the questions into the Q&A feature that you can find either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device, or you can type them directly into the chat. Also, if you would like to purchase a copy of the book this evening, we're encouraging you to go to Mercer University Press, the publishers of this book, and order it from them. We've heard there may be some signed copies at Mercer University Press, so if you would like to get one of those, we would encourage you to do so from them. But if you're not able to order from Mercer University Press, we also encourage you to order from any independent bookstore in the area. They've been working so hard during the pandemic, mailing books to homes, delivering books to homes, or providing curbside pickup. So we thank them also for their great support. We are so very pleased to have William Rawlings back tonight. He has done many programs for us over the years. He's a native, of course, of Sandersville, Georgia, and he's the author of so many wonderful books and essays. Of course, Lighthouses of the Georgia Coast is his 11th book, but by no means is his only work of nonfiction. He, of course, had Six Inches Deeper come out last year, which is about a 1972 Georgia murder, as well as the strange journey of the Confederate Constitution and the second coming of the Invisible Empire, which was about the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s, which specifically dealt with their involvement here in Atlanta. Not only is he an author of great nonfiction books about Georgia history, but he also writes fiction. Books like The Girl with the Kaleidoscope Eyes, the Mile High Club. And he also has some interesting works on a pig monument and the boll weevil. So we also encourage you to look for those as well. But right now he's going to give you a wonderful lecture that includes many photos. And we hope that you just sit back and enjoy the lighthouses of the Georgia coast. It is a beautiful book. Uh, we were talking about it earlier. It is a coffee table book that just fits in your hand. You can curl up on a chair in your bed at night with this and just find fascinating bits of history along with beautiful, beautiful photographs. It's a book about design, construction, lore, and the legacy of these monuments on the Georgia coast. So right now I would like to welcome William Rawlings. William? Thank you, Joe. It's, it's uh, a real pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, talking with everyone. Let me um, let me go ahead and start the presentation and I will sort of talk over it if I can. Let's, we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation tonight. So let's see if I'm doing this correctly. Here we go. And I think we can see this. Let's see. Now, is that good? Can you see that all right? Are we good here? I hope we are. We're good, William. Yes. Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about Lighthouses of the Georgia Coast, which is the topic of my uh, latest book, which was released last week. It's a nonfiction book, and the, it's about what the title says. It's about lighthouses, and this is an absolutely fascinating subject. I'll have to say it's a little different from anything I've written before. Um, the publisher, Mercy University Press, uh, suggested that I write this book. And I said, gee, that'll be a great thing to do. I like, I've always been fond of lighthouses. And in the process of doing this over a year or 18 months, I learned a lot and really enjoyed myself. So uh, sit back and enjoy things with me. This uh, presentation will be in two parts. The first part, which is fairly brief, is about, a back, is about the background of lighthouses. I think that even though we have lighthouses on the coast to look at, the more we understand about them, the more uh, meaningful they will come. And the second part, which perhaps takes up the majority of this program, will be about Georgia's five individual lighthouses, which I will discuss in more detail. So first of all, 
lighthouses, why do, why do we find them so fascinating? I, um, if you've written a few books, the, the, it's very common that someone will approach you on the street and say, hey, what are you doing now? What are you writing next? And I said, I'm writing a book on lighthouses. And the amazing thing was that people would come up and say, oh, yeah, I really like lighthouses. And then you would get this long series of things about why they found lighthouses important. And I was surprised about why they are so appealing to so many people and the diversity of, of opinions. First, they're historical monuments. As we'll discuss in a moment, the heyday of lighthouses has passed. And they are indeed monuments to our shared historical past today. Um, they reflect what our coast was in the 18th and 19th and early 20th centuries. And through them, we can learn about where we came from and perhaps where we're going. Secondly, they're Fascinating scientific instruments. I mean, we're, we're sitting now and looking at the rover on Mars, which was landed there, and we're see, about to see about a, a helicopter that can fly. And yet, back up a couple of hundred years ago, think about crossing the Atlantic Ocean to an unknown continent and having to land your ship and its crew safely. Lighthouses are part of a scientific designed network of navigational instruments, which have been long ago surpassed by more accurate navigational instruments, but they're, they're scientific instruments of sorts. And then there are places of mystery and romance. I'm sure that <clears throat> many of you that are listening to this have read um, Eugenia Price's uh, St. Simon's Trilogy, of which one book is called The Lighthouse. I'll have more to say about that. There was Jules Verne's The Lighthouse at the End of the Earth. There's Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. And there are a number of other books, including modern romance novels, which is apparently a big deal, that either involve lighthouses or have to do with them. Lighthouses are traditionally built in places of, of um, desolation far from the civilized world. And it's a great place to have a mystery or perhaps a romance. And finally, uh, they have become for many people metaphysical and spiritual symbols. We all talk about being tossed about on the stormy seas of life and seeing a lighthouse in the distance to find our way home. And there are other, there are other similar metaphors that have been applied to them. So for various reasons, people like lighthouses. And what I want to do here briefly, and I, I want to apologize before I do this, I want to give you a very brief history of American lighthouses. Not that this is vital to this talk, but I think it will sort of help you understand where we came from and where we're going. There have been many long, full volumes written on the history of American lighthouses. I'm going to do this in about less than three minutes, so bear with me. First of all, the first North American lighthouse was built in Boston Harbor in the year 1715. It was built not to save lives, but for commercial reasons in order to steer shipping into the harbor without getting sunk. It is still there. And in fact, is probably the only uh, functioning, um, actually officially functioning lighthouse in the United States today. Uh, and after the American Revolution, after the uh, ratification of the Constitution of 1787, the US, the federal government felt that it should take over lighthouses. There were about a dozen of them at the time and they were placed under the aegis of the treasury department who managed them for many, many years. This is a little tidbit that I want you to remember. A guy named Winslow Lewis. In 1812, Winslow Lewis patented a quote unquote new type of lighthouse lamp. And he dominated American lighthouse lighting and construction for the next several decades to the detriment of American lighthouses. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. And in 1820, Stephen Pleasanton became the Treasury Department's fifth auditor. Now, I hadn't heard the name fifth auditor before until I got into this. But in those days, the Treasury Department had a first auditor who was in charge of X, Y, and Z, and a so the second auditor was in charge of A, B, and C, and so forth. The lighthouses fell under the, under the control of the fifth auditor. Pleasanton was a accountant, first and foremost. His job was to save the government money. Here's a photo of him. You can see he's not a happy individual. This is a sad smile and big ears. And he's, he was said near the end of his tenure to have saved the government a lot of money by cutting back on the lighthouse cost. In 1852, 
after several decades of demands that the American Lighthouse system be improved, the lighthouse, a lighthouse board was created and they began to make the American Lighthouse system the best in the world. In 1861 through 1865, we have the American Civil War. This is an absolutely fascinating part of American history in reference to lighthouses, believe it or not. I'm going to mention this tangentially. Uh, there's a chapter in the book about lighthouses during the Civil War, but it is it was a very unique period of time. After the war, under the under the guide, guidance of the Lighthouse Board, the lighthouse keepers who theretofore had been political appointees, they made an effort to make them professionals. They required them in 1883 to wear uniforms from then until the present day. And in 1896, finally, lighthouses, lighthouse service fell under civil service. Up until that time, lighthouse keepers had been political appointees and as such were probably best known as a friend of a politician rather than someone suited to be a lighthouse keeper. In 1903, lighthouses were transferred to the Department of Commerce and Labor, later the Department of Commerce. In 1939, uh, just prior to World War II, lighthouses were transferred to the U.S. Coast Guard. If you know your history during World War I and later during World War II, German submarines operated off the East Coast of the United States. In those days, lighthouses became strategic assets related to our military defense. And finally, in the mid to late 20th century, lighthouses became navigational relics. And again, I'll talk more about this in a moment. And I apologize for that brief history, but I just want to give you an overview of what I think is a little important. People ask how many lighthouses are there in the United States? Well, you have to recall that these, that the lighthouses peaked in the early part of the 20th century. Going back to the found, foundation of the, of the country, we had a total of 12 lighthouses in 1790. In 1820, 30 years later, we had about five times that. And in 30 more years, we had about five times that. And if you look at the progression of lighthouses here from 12 in 1790 to 1706 and 1916, this is an exponential progression of lighthouses. This parallel closely American commerce and um, seafaring, and this is, where, this is why they were built. Also, as things evolved, we had light ships, which are, in essence were floating lighthouses. We had lighted buoys, we had fog signals, we had whistle buoys. And between 1790, when they only had a few buoys, uh, to 1916, a, a period of uh, a bit more than 100 years, we have a tremendous increase in the number of navigational aids in the United States. After, after about 1916, this we began an era of lighthouse decommissioning. There was still a few built, but this was probably the peak of lighthouses at this time. Now, to understand lighthouses, you probably need to know a little bit about how they were built and about how they worked. And that's what I want to talk about now. And again, uh, we're getting to the good stuff, to the Georgia how, lighthouses of the Georgia coast in a moment, but I think this is important. I want to talk about lighthouse types, about a brief few comments on lighthouse construction, about how they were lit and how the light projected over the dist over distance, and how lighthouses functioned, practically speaking. There are basically two types of lighthouses. One is land-based and the other is, is uh, wave swept. This is Sapelo Lighthouse, which some of you may recognize in Georgia's Sapelo Island Lighthouse. It was built in 1820 by Winslow Lewis, the man I mentioned earlier. It is masonry built of bricks with succo on top. And in essence, essentially all of the land-based lighthouses are built of masonry. Uh, which includes bricks and concrete <clears throat> or stone. Uh, there have been wooden lighthouses. They usually don't last very long. If a big storm comes up, that's the end of it. So that's the way lighthouses are built. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this country, and particularly in other parts of the world, you have lighthouses like this. This is a. This is actually at uh, in Lima, Peru, and I show this as a matter of interest. This is uh, for those of you that may know Lima along the Malecon facing the Pacific, this lighthouse has been put up. It was erected in 1900 and was built by the firm of Gustav Eiffel, that's Eiffel as in Eiffel Tower. 
this firm may, had a very large international business in making cast iron lighthouses that uh, were found around the world and many, many of them, in fact, most of them probably still exist. So some substantial for land-based lighthouses, either, either masonry of some sort or sometimes steel. On the other hand, there were what are known as wave swept lighthouses. That is lighthouses that are out in the open water, in the open sea or in a channel. This is the American Shoals Lighthouse on the left, now off the coast of Florida. It was built in 1880. It is what's known as a screw pile type lighthouse. This is anchored by, by screw piles, the long physical screws that are uh, embedded in the bottom. Lighthouse keepers lived here in the middle in this uh, residence, and this is a lighthouse on top. Um, it was designed to withstand a storm. That is basically the storm would blow right through it, as it were. This is um, one of the more famous lighthouses in the world. This is the Cordillera Lighthouse uh, off the coast of Southwest France. The original lighthouse was built in the year 1611. This lighthouse itself probably dates from the 18th century. It was built and rebuilt over several years. I show this to say that it's far out in the open sea. It's built on a high pedestal to withstand storms. And of course, at the top, it has the light as you see on both of these. So these are the, these are the two types, basically wind, uh, land-based or wind struck lighthouses. And there are many variations on this thing, but this gives you an idea of what we're talking about. All of Georgia's lighthouses are land-based. So we don't have any uh, offshore lighthouses like this. Now, lighthouse, architecture, lighthouse construction probably reached its peak in the mid 19th century. I, this is an English lighthouse. Um, I chose it because I have good pictures of it and kind of show you a few things, but it's, it's a typical lighthouse. It was built on Bishop Rock, which is off um, the Isles of Scilly in Southwest England. This particular lighthouse is 146 feet from the high water mark of the ocean to the pl uh, plane of the focal plane of the light at the top. It is built of stone, and here you can see in a cross section, these are cut stones that are meant to be physically interlocking to withstand the wind and the pounding of waves. The lighthouse itself has at the top a large lantern room, which you can see here. In this era, this would have been powered, uh, would have been a lamp burning oil, probably in 1850s whale oil. It would have been stored below in the oil room down here, or in the storeroom here. This would, this, the keepers would have stayed, here's a bedroom and a living room here. And basically a keeper would, would live here on this lighthouse far offshore for weeks or longer at a time and be supplied by more fuel in the light. This lighthouse is still there. It's been there for more than 150 years. This is important here. This is a weight trunk. There is a long, um, a long pipe, as it were, that runs down the middle of the lighthouse. And I'll show you this in other photos. This lighting mechanism rotated here. And since they didn't have any electricity there, it was a wind up clock like mechanism. And there was a weight that the lighthouse keeper would physically wind up like you would a grandfather clock. It would pull the weight up to the top of the weight trunk. And then as the weight, as the weight came down, it, it powered the turning of the lighthouse illumination itself. Now, lighthouse illumination. If you go back to the earliest years, and we're talking about the Roman Empire, lighthouses were little more than beacons built on a high promontory, or some, or more than fires built on a high promontory, or sometimes fires built on top of a, of a uh, pile of uh, rocks or a tower. As time went on, though, um, the, they were illuminated by candles like this, and also by simple oil lamps. You've no doubt seen oil lamps. They're nothing but a little container with a wick that you can put uh, animal uh, oil in, or you can put um, oil oil, and it burns like a candle. But there were advances. In the year 1782, man, a Frenchman named Ami Argand invented the Argand lamp. This was a great scientific advance in terms of illumination. Before you simply had a, a wick as, as in a candle or a lamp, but here he had a circular wick and he had a lighting chimney. 
this supplied fuel here. So they would light this and then the air would go through here. It burned much more efficiently. And one uh, Argan's lamp like this was equal to any number of simple oil lamps. So this was a great advance in lighthouse lighting. Around this time and before, uh, if you think about light, this is using this uh, fireplace, uh, this, this bonfire, light goes in every direction, but you really don't want to send it in every direction. You want to send it out to sea to help guide ships into harbor at night. And so um, for years, people had sometimes put a polished uh, piece of metal behind the bonfire or behind the lamp. And in the um, late, uh, uh, um, eight, late 18th century, early 19th century, they began to develop parabolic reflectors. So this is a Stevenson's uh, light that was perfected about 1810. This is a reflector here. The light would go up inside this and the light from this reflector would shine out in this direction. If you wanted to make the light red or some other color and wanted to make it more identifiable, you could put a piece of glass in front of it like this. And getting back to our friend Winslow Lewis, who I mentioned earlier, in 1810, he invented a, quote, new lamp, believe it or not. In fact, he went to the United States government and got a patent on it. Well, his lamp wasn't exactly new. It was, may have been new in the United States, but it wasn't new in the world. He basically took an argan lamp and put it there. He basically used Stevenson's reflector and put it here. And he borrowed this, this uh, Plano convex lens from... Uh, from an Englishman named John Rogers and had a lamp with a reflector and a lens. This was not anything really good. In fact, it was said to be a pretty sorry lamp, but it was better than what had existed before. And in 1812, the United States government contracted with Winslow Lewis to provide lamps for all of American lighthouses. In fact, he became one of the major forces in lighthouse construction for the next several decades much to the detriment of American lighthouses, um, as I will discuss in a moment. This gets back to Stephen Pleasanton. You remember the man with the frown and the big ears? He and Winslow Lewis were big buds, and he in, he in essence outsourced lighthouse maintenance and construction to Winslow Lewis. It held American lighthouses and navigation back for decades. The real advance, not only in lighthouses, but in lighting in general was that of Augustin Jean Fresnel. This is F-R-E-S-N-E-L, pronounced F-R-E-N-E-L, Fresnel. He thought, that he thought about things. He was a polymath, a bit of a scientist. This is a lamp here, and you can imagine that light goes in all directions, but you don't want it to go all directions. You want to direct it in one spot. So he devised what was called a stepped prism. It looks like this. Here's a side view. And this is what we refer to as a bullseye lens. He had prisms on the side here. So when the light came out from this lamp, these prisms were directed in this direction. The bullseye lens would focus it in this direction. So that lighting was all of a sudden much more efficiently used. Whereas it may have taken multiple oil lamps to project a light with, with Fresnel's um, lens. Um, lighthouses were suddenly far, far brighter than they had been before. This, the first lighthouse to have a Fresnel lens was the Cordonac Lighthouse in France that I showed you earlier. It was installed in 1823. And by the 1830s, many, if not most of the lighthouses in France and in England began to have Fresnel lenses, which were uh, far, far better than Winslow Lewis's lamp and lamps that we were using in America. This is a Fresnel lens, again, like the lighthouse I showed you. You can see this is the bullseye lens and the prisms that reflect the light out. This would have been a rotating lighthouse and the beacon would rotate. Here's a wind up clock mechanism and here's the weight coming down here. In some, some cases it would run down this tube like I showed you, but here it's dropping directly down. And so the lighthouse keeper would uh, keep oil in the lamps, would wind this up once or twice or three times a day. And during at night, during night, this would rotate and send light out to ships. It may be that the, that the lens itself rotated in some cases, or in some cases, the lanterns rotated. They were, rotated. There were many variations. 
this is a, these are full blown Fresnel lenses that were found in late 19th century lighthouses. These were taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica, by the way, in 1911, so you get an idea of age. These stood about 15 feet tall. They're massive things. Uh, I'll show you one in the uh, uh, St. Simon's Lighthouse. It looks very similar to this in a few minutes. But these were, these were the high points of lighthouses in the days in, in, during, during their heyday in the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century. So, so how did lighthouses work? First of all, they were day marks or sea marks by day. That is a, a sea mark is something, is very something is the opposite of a landmark. A landmark is something on land that you can uh, judge your position by. And a sea mark is the same thing in the sea. A day mark is something that you can see during the day. Um, at night, they were lighted beacons. They were part of a navigational system, including buoys, range lights, light ships in summer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about range lights in a minute. They were watchtowers of the sea with economic, humanitarian, and military roles. Remember, their job was as much as anything to guide ships into port. Uh, in the 17th century, uh, it was said that one out of every three British seamen lost their life at sea. It was a very dangerous profession, but also the ship's owner says, well, we're losing a lot of men, but we're using our car losing our cargoes too. So the impetus behind many early, early lighthouses was economic. Humanitarian, uh, I can't tell you how many stories there are of lighthouse keepers who spotted ships foundering and went out and saved the crew. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, they had military roles, particularly along the coast, looking for ships and, for, and more recently for submarines. Today, they're historic monuments to the shared history of our past and they're beautiful inspirational structures. Now, I hope that wasn't too dreary or too boring. So let's get to the good stuff now with apologies for before, but we know a little bit about lighthouses, I hope. This is, we'll talk about lighthouses at the Georgia coast. This is actually a, a little Cumberland lighthouse here. I'll say more about that in a moment. Georgia Coast has a total of five lighthouses. Here in the Savannah area, you have Tybee Lighthouse, which is on Tybee Island, and Cockspur Lighthouse, which is at the end of Savannah River, just behind. You can see one lighthouse from the other. They're that close together. Many of you who've been to, who've been to Savannah have seen these. At Sapelo, there's a lighthouse on the southern end of Sapelo Island here. There's a fourth lighthouse on the southern end of St. Simon's Island here, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And there is a lighthouse now on the north end of Little Cumberland Island. This is the Cumberland Island complex that's divided in the north to Little Cumberland Island and south to Big Cumberland Island here. So we have five lighthouses on our coast. This is the Tybee Island Lighthouse and it is, it is fantastic. There's no other word. Um, it is probably one of the best preserved light stations. I use that word to mean include the lighthouse and the accompanying buildings. It's one of the best preserved light stations on the east coast of the United States. It's remarkably intact. Um, these, these buildings were present in 1861. I'm going to show you another slide in a moment. This building was built in 1890. This is, these are three keepers dwellings, one, two, three. And behind this dwelling, there's a, um, there's a cookhouse that was built in 1812, still there and so forth. It's a beautiful place and easily accessible. Well, Tybee Lighthouse is located at the tip of Tybee Island here, right at Tybee Roads, right at the uh, estuary of the Savannah River, which is here. It, um, it's part of a complex that later became a fort but it's very extremely well preserved and is now owned, now owned by the, uh, I believe the Tybee Island Historical Society, managed by the Tybee Island Historical Society, and is one of the best, best maintained and best lighthouses that we have. Um, the lighthouse itself, this one is, I want to say the third of several lighthouses. Uh, as you know, James Oglethorpe uh, and the colonists settled the city of Savannah up several, about 17 or 18 miles up Savannah River. And as guidance was needed to get in the, in the mouth of Savannah River, he directed the colonists build a lighthouse. It was not, a, a, I'm sorry, a, a beacon tower because it was not lighted. It was a wooden tower that was completed in the late 1830s. It didn't last very long. 
it was soon torn down by a storm and a second wooden tower was built uh, thereafter. It didn't last very long. It was, it was pushed, pushed out by a storm. It may be that the second tower was lighted. It's uncertain. The first tower was certainly not lighted. And as much as anything, they were day marks and used um, uh, for ship um, coming to toward the river mouth to have a point of reference to focus on. The main tower was an octagonal tower, which was built in the year 1773. And it was still in use uh, at the time of the Civil War. I want to show these because if you will notice, they all have different markings. This was the marking in 1914. This is 1985. It was simply a white tower in 1914. It had one marking today. This has a different marking. There have been a series of markings over the years that this tower has had since its um, original construction uh, nearly 250 years ago. The fascinating thing about that I find personal about Tybee relates to the Civil War. In January 1861, the state of Georgia voted to secede from the Union. And in March of 1861, the Confederate States of America developed the Confederate uh, Lighthouse Service, Confederate Lighthouse Bureau. At the time we had, if you recall what I said earlier, we had the United States Lighthouse Bureau. They basically said, we're going to have the same thing and we're just going to call it by something different. In April 1861, there was the Fort Sumter incident in South Carolina, which started the Civil War. It was, it was the first fire, first arms uh, fire during the Civil War. And within a matter of days after Fort Sumter, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States, uh, instituted a naval embargo of the South. And lighthouses, which theretofore had been important in trade, and had helped guide ships into port were now something different. The South, the wealth of the South was related to cotton and the South's ability to export cotton. In fact, that was what was going to fund the South side of the Civil War. But all of a sudden you had these uh, Union ships offshore that were looking to block any commerce and lighthouses were detrimental. So on a systematic basis, essentially every lighthouse in the Confederacy was, was made dark. In June, on this piece of paper, in June 1861, uh, Linville and Smedberg, who were machinists and engineers from the Fort of Savannah, were paid $267.17 to dismantle the light out of the tiny lighthouse and to put it in storage. So it was no longer useful for, uh, for as uh, as a guide to the northern ships. In November 1861, federal troops came ashore on Tybee Island. The Confederates, however, didn't want the lighthouse to be any use because it would make a great observational tower here. So what they did was they decided to set it on fire, and they did. This is from Harper's Weekly in November 1871, the burning of the uh, Confederate lighthouse here. And it was hoped that this would this destroy the interior steps, which were made of wood, and this was hoped this would make it useless. But un unfortunately for Confederates, and fortunately for the Union, this was, uh, they had it repaired and then ready to use as an observation post within a matter of weeks. If you recall earlier, I said the buildings at the Tybee Lighthouse are still present. These are the ones here on the left and here on the right, and this is the cookhouse that you couldn't see behind the third thing, but these buildings are still present there. It's a fascinating story. Uh, after the war was over, uh, the, there was questions to what to do with the lighthouse. And after considering it, it was decided to go ahead and rebuild it. What they did, they took the old lighthouse here and they, in, they increased its, its height by a, by a number of, of feet here. They added, they added on this top, the blue part that you can see on top was added on. It was the, originally, it was about hundred feet tall. This added about 45 more feet. And today, the, the current light is about, 100, um, is about 145 feet to the top of the tower here. This is the original, and this is the stuff that was new. This is the actual lighthouse that you get to climb if you go to Tybee, all the 170 odd steps, I believe. I can't remember the exact number, but it's quite a climb. You can rest and look out a window on the way up and down. 
So this was rebuilt after the Civil War and um, put back into um, put back into service. Um, the next house, the next lighthouse is the one on Coxburn Lighthouse. This is a picture of it taken in 1885 when it was when it was functioning as a lighthouse. To give you an idea of where it is. This is, this, again, this is a Tybee Lighthouse here. The Coxborough Lighthouse is here at the mouth of the Savannah River. The Savannah River has two channels. The one is to the north here and the other is to the south here. And in the, in the mid 18th century and really up through the early 20th century, both channels were in common use. Today, it's only the north channel that is kept open the Savannah River. And the, the south channel is useful for small boats, but not for commerce. But this was quite important as, as the port facilities were further inland and, and you had to get had to go up the river and so they needed something guiding to, to get you there. The, um, this was a complex area and there were a number of so-called beacons. These didn't seem to qualify as lighthouses. They were simply lighted beacons along this area around there. The, this beacon here was the last one built. This was built on Coxborough Island in 1848. It was lighted and was destroyed in a hurricane in 1854. Uh, after this, uh, it was decided to build a formal lighthouse. And this is the Coxborough Lighthouse that we have today. It was constructed in 1856. This is a diagram of it. In total, it's about 45 feet high above the base grade. You come up about uh, nine to 10 feet to the uh, above, uh, above grade. At high water level, the water gets to right about here at the base of the top of the steps, but you can see that it has a um, lantern room and a pair of steps going up on the inside. The lighthouse keeper lived uh, nearby in Fort Pulaski or, or in that area and would come out during the day to take care of the light. These are current photographs of the lighthouse. You, it's, um, it, was, it served um, up until 1909 when it was decommissioned for, so for more than 110 years, it's not been formally used as a lighthouse. It's there. If you want to see it, you can go to Fort Pulaski and uh, walk out toward it. This is at high tide and this is at low tide from another view. Perhaps so the most interesting thing about the Coxburgh Lighthouse is that it exists at all today because on April 10th and 11th, 1862, it was in direct fire, line of fire of the bombardment of Fort Pulaski by Union troops. Here's a little bit better view. This is the mouth of the Savannah River. This is Tybee and here's the lighthouse here, Tybee Lighthouse. This is Fort Pulaski, Fort, the, uh, the Coxburg Lighthouse would be out this area here. This is the Savannah and the North and South Channels heading to the city of Savannah. This fort was supposed to be impregnable. This was going to protect the city of Savannah from, from uh, Northern troops. So between November 1861, when they occupied Tybee Island and April of 1862, Union troops surreptitiously and behind camouflage can constructed a series of artillery batteries here, all aimed at Fort Pulaski. So on April 10th, 1861, they sent a polite note to the commander, a guy named Olmsted, Colonel Olmsted, who was commanding Fort Pulaski and said, dear sir, we have a bunch of uh, weapons ranged at you. We wish that you would surrender. And he said, he's not going to. So they opened up a 30 some odd hour bombardment of, this, of, the, of the fort. And I'll say more about that in a moment. The lighthouse was in the direct line of fire, but miraculously it escaped damage, mainly because the shells had to arch up and down to hit Fort Pulaski. This was incidentally the first use of rifle cannon in warfare anywhere in the world. If you're ever in Tybee, there is a little street off the side here named Battery Drive. It's, uh, it's access to a failed subdivision, but it has a great view of, of the lighthouse that you can see from here and a somewhat view of Fort Pulaski in the distance. Needless to say, Fort Pulaski didn't do well. This is Fort Pulaski after the bombardment. That could have been the lighthouse, but it wasn't. The other interesting tale about the uh, 
Coxburgh Lighthouse is Florence Martis, Savannah's Waving Girl. I know that many of you have heard of her. It's hard to go to Savannah without seeing the statue of the Waving Girl or having heard the stories. She was the daughter and the sister of lighthouse keepers. Her father was the lighthouse keeper for the Coxburgh Lighthouse. She was born in 1868. And as a young girl, she had a bout of diphtheria and was said to have lost her voice. As you may recall, there was a tremendous earthquake in Charleston in the year 1886. In modern terms, it was estimated to be 7.3 on the Richter scale. It was felt up and down the entire East Coast of the United States. And there's lots of stories about the earthquake and lighthouse keepers who were in the light when the earthquake hit. But she was there and she uh, was apparently shaken by the earthquake and she magically regained her voice, which she had lost when she had diphtheria. And thereafter, she started waving to every ship that came by and it was said for a period of nearly half a century she waved to as many as 50,000 ships. At night when a ship would come by her faithful dogs would bark and wake her, wake her up. It's quite a story. She, uh, she died in 1943. There's a lot of interesting things to be said about her. There was um, a ship, a Liberty ship named the U USS Florence Martis. It's a great story that's associated with the Coxborough Lighthouse. Moving further south, we have the Sapelo Lighthouse. This is uh, a special one in that it was built by um, Winslow Lewis, the man that I've mentioned several times. It was constructed between 1819 and 1820 on the southern tip of Sapelo Island. This is a view taken today. This is Sapelo that leads into Doughboy Sound here. Uh, in those days, Darien over here on the coast, as well as Brunswick, were a major trading force. Darien less so today. And even though it looks logically that you should approach up the Altamaha River here, the best way to get to Darien was coming to Doughboy Sound and follow these little tidal uh, creeks here to get to the port of Darien. So this was very important. There was also another lighthouse across the way, or, or, or a large beacon across the way on Wolf Island. It's, it was washed away in a hurricane and late 19th century, but Sapelo is here. It, um, it's, it's really quite an interesting um, thing to see. Uh, this is a picture of Sapelo Lighthouse in 1885. Um, it was uh, 65 feet tall and had a lantern room that added an additional 15 feet, so you had about 80 feet of uh, height to it. The paint scheme here was done probably in the 1850s, when the lighthouse board that I mentioned earlier that was created in 1852 came, in, came um, into being, besides changing out the lights from the old outdated Lewis uh, lights to the new Fresnel lenses, they had a number of lighthouses painted, such as the one in Savannah that I showed you with the black and white marking, and this has red and white markings. As I said, this photo was taken in 1885, and you can see from, or get the impression that you're quite a distance from the edge of the, uh, of the uh, ocean here. You're well, a couple hundred feet, it looks like. Um, in 1889, there was a terrible hurricane, and the lighthouse, I'll go, uh, the lighthouse keeper and his wife and his family took refuge in the top of the lighthouse. It was said to be 35 foot waves beat against the lighthouse, but it survived. The lighthouse survived, but the keeper's cottage that I showed you in the previous uh, slide, the keeper's cottage was made uninhabitable. And this is a cistern from the keeper's cottage. This was the old oil house here. And the lighthouse, the next year in 1899 was deemed uh, unusable and was decommissioned at that time. So this lighthouse per se has not been used as a beacon in, in more than 120 years. But uh, in, 18, in 1997, it came to the attention of people that this was an important historical treasure. So what they did, they did their best to restore it. This is the interior. You can see what it looked like prior to restoration. These are the steps from the 19th century. This is the steps after restoration inside the lighthouse. Now it's been completely restored. And this, it was opened again in 1998. Uh, I think as we speak now, they are doing a second restoration on the lighthouse to keep, keep, keep it um, up to date. I mentioned range lights. 
this is a very unique range light. A range light was another secondary light that was near a lighthouse that could be used to line up on by a ship coming into a harbor. For example, if you could see another little small light plus the lighthouse light and line the two of them up, you could get your head in exactly. And if you could see how far apart they were, you could tell what distance you were at night. This is a cast iron range light, which is right next to the 1820 tower there on Sapelo Island. It is a very unique piece of architecture and probably one of the few, if any, that exist in the world. So it's, if you're a lighthouse aficionado, it's certainly something, certainly something worth seeing. As I said in 1899, the lighthouse was, was decommissioned. And in 1903, between 1903 and 1905, a new steel frame lighthouse was built on the other side of this little spit of land. This is the main body of land of Cyclo Island. This is the ocean to the bottom of the screen here. This photograph would have been taken probably in the 1920s. You can see the abandoned lighthouse from 1820 plus the oil house. This was the over here at the lower right hand corner. These were remains of a uh, World War I era fort that was there. But this was built um, as a replacement lighthouse in 1905. It was quite a big structure, very well done. It was a steel frame lighthouse, not particularly different from the American Shoals lighthouse I showed you. Um, it's different from most uh, land-based lighthouses. It, was, it functioned between 19, 1905 and 1933. By that time, it was decided that the commerce into uh, Dillboy Sound and into Darien had fallen off to the point that there was no sense in maintaining another a lighthouse there at all. So it was decommissioned and these buildings were torn down and sold for scrap. The lighthouse itself was taken apart and shipped to Michigan where it now still exists, um, resurrected on, on uh, one of the Great Lakes in Michigan. The only thing there now is the bottom of this has been built as an observation tower. So if you visit, you get a good overview of things, but this entire structure is now missing. And now we come to what I call the second crown jewel or the first crown jewel, depending on your uh, where you live, of the Georgia coast lighthouse is the St. Simon's Lighthouse. This is an absolute wonderful beauty. It is, it is magnificent, there's no other word for it. For those of you that have been to St. Simon's, this is right at near, right just up from St. Simon's Village. It's uh, not too far from the casino, which you may well know. Um, it was not the first lighthouse built there. Um, it's located right here at the tip of St. Of St. Simon's, right into St. Simon's Sound. You can get a good look of, of the Golden Ray, which they're cutting up over here now. This is Jekyll Island right here, in the northern tip of Jekyll Island. Um, the first lighthouse built uh, in this area was built by a fellow named James Gould in 1810. And the, again, those of you who've read uh, Eugenia Price's novel, The Lighthouse, will know have heard the name James Gould. She makes him a character in, in the story. Um, he uh, moved south from Massachusetts to build this lighthouse and to seek fame and fortune. And apparently he did well in her book and apparently in real life he did well also. This lighthouse was 75 feet tall to the top of the tower. It was originally illuminated by candles, I was said, and then later switched to Lewis lamps, the Winslow Lewis lamps. And then, um, and apparently um, had near the end had a Fresnel lens in the top, but I don't really know about that. With the outbreak of the Civil War, as I said, you know, they set fire to the um, to the Tybee Lighthouse. In this lighthouse, they put several kegs of powder and they literally blew it up in September 1861. It was totally destroyed by, by uh, explosives. Um, when the war was over, the decision was made to build another lighthouse. These are a fine set of plans, and this is the lighthouse that we have today. This is, a, as I said, it's absolutely magnificent. It is pristine. It is perfectly preserved. It has been restored, and you can look it in this lighthouse and, and understand exactly what was happening more than 100 years ago, 150 years ago, for example, when this was built. Um, 
it's, it's quite, a, quite a construction. It had a Fresnel lens in the top, which I'll show you in a little bit. This is a keeper's, keeper's cottage, which is here. And next door to this, just to the, to the right of this house is the uh, coastal Georgia, so, so headquarters of the Coastal Georgia Historical Society, which is a wonderful resource for those of you that are interested in the history of Georgia's coast. This next next photograph is is one that I'm I'm really I'm fascinated about this photo. This was taken in 1870 71 or thereabouts, and this is the construction of the new live Tybee Lighthouse. Here you can see it's made of brick, and you can see the brick is going up here. This is a lighthouse per se. You're looking at it from the back. And you can see the lighthouse keeper's cottage here. Looks the same today as it did then. But look at this thing over there. I, I, I saw this originally. I said, gosh, what is that? And I realized by amazement, this is the stump, the remains of the, of the uh, 1810 lighthouse that was blown up by the Confederates in 1861. And it's right next door to where the new lighthouse was. And I said, oh, you've got the old lighthouse and the new lighthouse here. So this is, this is a real jewel. The lighthouse today, um, the lighthouse, this is in 1886. The lighthouse today, the, the coast has moved in about 400 feet closer. So today you're really almost a stone's throw from the edge of the, uh, of the water. Back when the lighthouse was built, you, was, you were at least 400 feet away from the edge of the coast. There were a number of storms over the years that have eroded the coastline. It's pretty stable now, and, uh, but the lighthouse is far closer than it was. So this is 1886. The nice thing about the Tybee Lighthouse as well as the lighthouse in St. Simon, and, and, and a, a nice thing about St. Simon's Lighthouse as well as the, the lighthouse in Tybee is that you can call, crawl up and get a look at the Fresnel lens. This is the top of the Fresnel lens. This was uh, installed when the lighthouse was built in the 1870s. There's a uh, plaque on it. I researched it. This light, this, this light was apparently built in France sometime between about 1855 and 1870, brought here and put in the new lighthouse when it was officially relit in 1872. This is it's, it's an amazing shape. Um, and this is another view. You can see in the background the Coastal Georgia Historical Society. And of course, I mentioned earlier about lighthouses being haunted. Well, I, I wouldn't be doing everybody, I would do everybody a disservice if I didn't mention at least one ghost story. In uh, 1880, the assistant keeper to the lighthouse shot and killed the lighthouse keeper. Now, I, I, I can go back and show you the slide, but I won't. But this had this one house basically had two apartments. The assistant keeper lived upstairs and the keeper downstairs or vice versa, I don't know. And apparently there was a dispute one day. If you listen to, depending on which side you listen to, but one, one party said it was due to chickens, a dispute over chickens. And another party said that one, one of the lighthouse keepers had made a pass at the other man's wife. And so whatever happened, it led to a gun battle where the uh, assistant lighthouse keeper killed the lighthouse keeper. And um, it was, it's, it's interesting to read the newspaper reports. The, the assistant keeper who shot his boss they took his boss off to be treated. He didn't want anything to happen to the lighthouse. So as soon as he found out his boss was stable, he went back and started attending to the lighthouse. Later, of course, his boss died and that was not good. He was eventually brought to trial and they acquitted him. Apparently it was justifiable homicide. I don't know the details, but apparently there are very well, well, very well documented or should I say oft repeated stories about mysterious footsteps in the tower at night. It's a great story. And if you visit, I'm sure they can tell you a lot more about it. This is a wonderful place to visit. And the museum, there's a little bit of a museum inside as well as some exhibits next door. Our final lighthouse is out of Little Cumberland Island. This is a this is a beautiful lighthouse and it's it's not open to the public. Little Cumberland Island is, is privately owned. Um, it was abandoned in um, 1909 and stayed abandoned for many, many years. It's at the north end of Little Cumberland Island here. Let me show you a map. This is, this is um, St. Andrew Sound. And you can, this is the back way up to Brunswick by Jekyll Island here. And this is another back way down to um, St. Mary's here. Again, I said there was a former lighthouse at the end, lower end of Cumberland, but this lighthouse was tip of Little Cumberland Island up here. Um, it was, 
1820, Winslow Lewis constructed a lighthouse here. This is a rather low lying area and it was decided later that it was not the best spot for a lighthouse. So in the 1830s, the lighthouse was dismantled and moved over here to Amelia Island. Meanwhile, in the 1837-1838, um, the Little Cumberland Lighthouse was being constructed. It um, was fitted initially with Winslow Lewis's lenses, and later in the 1850s was fitted with a Fresnel lens. Like the other lighthouses of the Georgia coast, it was dark during the Civil War. Its lens disappeared, and no one really knows. Uh, what happened to it. Um, the lighthouse was in use, as I said, until I said earlier, 1909, it was, it was decommissioned in 1915. So has not functioned now in more than a hundred years. It was basically abandoned in March, 1915. Um, the Little Cumberland Island is a fascinating place. Uh, Big Cumberland Island is owned, in, in, in essence, owned by the government, by the federal government. It's part of the Cumberland Island seashore, and that's not exactly correct. There are, there are some private holdings there, but it, the government is in charge of it. The Cumberland Island National Seashore, Little Cumberland Island is privately owned, but is a part of the Cumberland Island National Seashore. There is very limited development there and very strict observation of, con of, of conservational rules to preserve the environment. Uh, in the 20th century, there were several people that owned Little Cumberland Island. They hoped to develop it uh, in the same way that St. Simons and others have been developed. It didn't happen. In 1961, Little Cumberland Island was acquired by the Little Cumberland Island Homes Association with the purpose, the stated purpose of preserving the island in its natural state and all that went with it. And this had to do with the lighthouse. So, this lighthouse, which had been abandoned in 1915, was like this around 1960 when the Little Cumberland Island uh, uh, Homes Association purchased the island. Here you can see the lighthouse here. You notice that the light room is in ruins here. There were two keepers cottages. This is the older and this is the newer one. This was built about the same time. The one at the bottom was built about the same time um, as the one at um, St. Simon's. This was made of brick. So they decided over a period of years to see if they could not restore the lighthouse. These structures were beyond saving, they were torn down. And in the 1990s, and again, within the last 10 years, last five years really, there had been conservation efforts to restore and restore this lighthouse. You can see here, they're digging out, the lighthouse had become silted up very, very high. In fact, the door was, was covered up with, with sand, blowing sand. They restored it here. You can see it had no windows, but this is the start of restoration. And today it is, it is a monument that is absolutely beautiful. It is wonderful. Um, you, this is from the coast. You can see it here. Two stories I'll tell you briefly, and then it'll be the end of my presentation. One is about the slave ship Wanderer. This was the penultimate slave ship to come in to bring slaves to the United States. Slave, the international slave trade was out, outlawed and made illegal in, in January 1st, 1808. A number of people tried to smuggle slaves from Africa here. <clears throat> in 1858, um, a slave ship uh, out of, um, <clears throat> out of um, Savannah, went to Africa, picked up a cargo of more than 400 human beings and brought it back. They, they wanted to get into um, St. Andrew's Sound. They contracted with the lighthouse keeper uh, at Little Cumberland Lighthouse who charged them a full year's salary to pilot the ship into shore. And they offloaded the shores at the, the slaves at the lower end of Jekyll Island. And if you ever go to the St. Andrew picnic ground, which is in the south end of Jekyll Island. There's some wonderful monuments to the slave ship Wanderer. One other little thing, this island, well, the, the island was, was uh, occupied by federal troops in March, 1862. This is a photograph of the Little Cumberland Lighthouse at that time with the American flag flying above. So with the exception of Little Cumberland, all of Georgia's lighthouses are open to the public. They, are, they welcome visitors. Little Cumberland is private. I, I have been told to express to people that you're welcome to look at it from a great distance, but the island is private and they don't want you to visit on shore, which I think is reasonable. If I can answer any questions, I would be very happy to do so.
Thank you so much, William. That was absolutely fascinating. And we do have a few questions to start off. And as a reminder to everyone, go ahead and put those in the Q&A feature, or you can use the chat if you would like. So let's start off with a few that we already have in. Uh, one of them is from Sarah. And she asks, given the isolation of lighthouse keepers, what was the average tenure and life expectancy of the keepers? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, it, there was a fairly big turnover, depending very much on the lighthouses, on the, on the lighthouses location. In certain places we see, for example, Tybee and, and uh, uh, St. Simon's lighthouses is in urban areas today, which indeed they are, but, but in the years past, these were terribly desolate places. And on the, you know, on the American West Coast, for example, you were, you were uh, isolated. And these, of course, the wave strip lighthouses, you don't know. Um, the lighthouse, lighthouse Bureau encouraged lighthouse keepers to get married, thinking they would be happier if they had a spouse. Uh, in many cases, in, in a surprising large number of cases, the spouses of lighthouse keepers became lighthouse keepers themselves. And as I say in the book, um, I, I have a short section on lighthouse heroes, but I have a much longer section on lighthouse heroines. Um, Briefly, I don't know the answer to that question. It was highly variable. It was a difficult thing. And the people that stayed there were of a particular mind that they liked the isolation. I think we're, I think we're muted here. I do also like in your book, speaking of lighthouse keepers, there's a great picture of a lighthouse keepers library um, that kind of predates the little free libraries you see popping up in neighborhoods. But I just enjoyed how it, it said that it was filled with items that were, you know, a little bit religious, a little bit fiction to, to give them something to do while they were in the lighthouses and, and maybe had a little bit free time on their hands. So we also have a question about um, if you're planning to do any more lighthouse books, in particular, any farther up the East Coast, maybe North Carolina, Virginia, um, you know, has this is this spurred your your lighthouse um, enjoyment and endeavor to to delve more into the history of that? Uh, no, I'm not personally planning anymore, but um, it, it, it's it's fascinating. I wouldn't mind writing another book on lighthouses, but I'm going to write about some other things. In fact, my book, my work, my book I'm working on for next year is un, unrelated. It's nonfiction. Um, I, there's a lot that have been written about lighthouses, and perhaps one of the best sources online is the United States Lighthouse Service. And I and I. Uh, I, I'm sorry, the United States Lighthouse Society, forgive me. It's uslhs.org. And that is an excellent, excellent resource for anybody interested in lighthouses. There's a lot on lighthouses online and a lot of it is uh, detailed, but the best single source is the United States Lighthouse Society, uslhs.org. I can refer you to that, almost anything you want to know. There are a number of excellent lighthouse books um, um, that are available, and I, and I think it, it would. I, I list them in the back of my book if you'd like to do some additional reading. Excellent. Um, so a few more. We have a very interesting one that just came in, um, and it asks: Given the metaphysical studies and symbolism of lighthouse, do you feel that H. P. Lovecraft was drawn to them as well through his writings? Well, you know, I don't want to appear as ignorant as I am. If I if I had read any of his books, I'd probably give you an intelligent answer right now. I'd have to say, I simply don't know. Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure of the particular, you know, um, stories of Lovecrafts they may be referencing, but I mean, you, you, you look at um, some of the, the um, movies and, and television shows, you know, there was the ghost in Mrs. Muir that took place in a lighthouse and, you know, mm -hmm. Pete's Dragon that had a lighthouse. You know, there was always some sort of fascination with them, um, you know, whether it had a, a sort of, um, you know, supernatural um, or, or, you know, well, well it's, it, it's, it's the sort of thing that, that leads you to think this. Imagine, imagine you're on an offshore lighthouse and it's you and the other lighthouse keeper and you're all alone for weeks at a time. And, you know, there's some dispute over who's going to eat the last scrap of bread. And you can imagine what sort of 
sort of things that a fertile mind of a writer would come up with. I, I could certainly think of some things. Uh, Jules Verne's The Lighthouse at the End of the World is, a, is an interesting uh, mystery in an isolated lighthouse. It was, I think the date is something like 1906. I can't remember. It's, it may have been before that. I can't remember the date of the book, but it's an interesting thing. Um, it's, it, it's, it's like a lot of things um, that one writes about. You just simply need the right elements and then you can spin a plot from it. Isolation, craziness, uh, you know, time, stress, lots of things could happen. Well, and, and especially in that one picture that you, you showed the, the sort of like um, the, the, the way, the, the seaside lighthouses that, you know, they were, they were out in the water offshore and, and you know, they lived higher up but were brought supplies. I mean, you, you were almost shut in a tower, you know, you and someone else. I mean, that that's just- Yeah, a, yeah. yeah. And there, there are lots of stories too. Um, um, I mean, there, there are lots of stories about lighthouse keepers and things that happened or, or this or that. I, 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 didn't, I didn't go into a lot of detail in my book because I thought it was, there, there are books that are more pointed toward that sort of thing. So I, I, there's a chapter on lighthouse keepers where I touch on a lot of that, but um, and and there's also a chapter on the symbolism of lighthouses. So I'm going to combine. We got two questions from Linda and Walter, and I'm going to go ahead and combine those for you. Um, the first asks, "How long did it take you to research and write this book?" And then a follow up with that that, that kind of um, dovetails into it was given the desire to develop so much of the coast, what do you give credit for to those structures being preserved, especially since the historical significance was apparently not recognized in the, you know, so long ago? Uh, the first part of the question is, uh, it took me about a year and a half to write this book. Um, it, it, you know, writing is, writing is, something that one does at one's own pace. If I were writing a book of fiction, I can whip through one in a matter of months. When it comes to nonfiction, the main thing is that you absolutely have to be correct. And so you can't let little things slip by. You can't guess and you can't speculate. You have to be right. So <clears throat> as you probably can see from this book, it's, it's very well footnoted uh, when necessary. And I try to make sure that no one will call me up and say, gee, you made a mistake. I, I, um, that's the way I like to do my nonfiction. Uh, in terms of um, why lighthouses have been preserved, mainly because they've been abandoned and, and they were built of masonry. And then, you know, the, the, the Little Cumberland Lighthouse, I mean, I'm sorry, the Little Cumberland Lighthouse and the Sample Island Lighthouse, for example, were both abandoned essentially for a century and they were still standing after 100 years. And so they could be restored, at least in part. That's that's why they've been restored. The lighthouses in um, lighthouses in Tybee and the lighthouses in St. Simons have always been maintained by interested parties. One thing that I didn't say earlier is that by the end, about 20 years ago, the last of the national lighthouses was essentially decommissioned. Yes, the lighthouses may still function, and yes, they may still beam, and yes, they may still be used for navigational purposes, but in terms of being regulated by a central authority, no, not really. They're mostly privately owned now, or, or owned uh, privately owned by, by worthy societies, such as historical societies. Thank you. So, we have time for just a few more to wrap up this evening. Um, and we have one from Lorena. Now we already know Cumberland Island is private. So we, view, we need to view it from afar, but she asks that if you could visit only one lighthouse, what would you recommend seeing? If you've never visited a lighthouse, um, I think any lighthouse is inspiring, and I, and I hate to pick out one above the other because on a personal basis, I find it's like your friends. You have this friend, and he's really good, and you enjoy his company because he tells great jokes, and you have this friend, and you really like her company because she's fun to be with, and she plays golf with you or something like that. You know, With lighthouses, if you don't know much about lighthouses, I would recommend visiting either St. Simons or Tybee. And the reason I say these two is that they are 
the best preserved of our lighthouses. They have the whole thing, the keeper's cottages, the, high, the, the towers, the Fresnel lenses, and they also have some museum facilities that are good. You can learn more from either one of those. And I, I rank them equally important. I, I, um, the other lighthouses, I don't want in any, any way uh, denigrate them. They're fantastic, but they're um, less accessible as it were. And uh, uh, Coxburgh Island is, is, you can't get out there unless you go in a boat and even then you can't get inside. Uh, um, and uh, Sapelo and Little Carmel were both abandoned for a century before being restored. So they don't have a lot of the support system that was there originally. I said, well, William, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating talk. Once again, we put the uh, website in the chat for Mercer University Press. If you would like to order a copy of Lighthouses of the Georgia Coast, feel free to go ahead and contact Mercer University Press. Hopefully you'll be able to get a signed copy of it. If not, I'm sure Mercer University Press can make some arrangements for you to get those shipped out to you. William, once again, thank you so very much for giving us this great history of the Georgia Lighthouses. Thank you all for allowing us to come into your homes this evening, and we hope to see you again very, very soon. Have a good evening.